Hey, this is Cam with Blacktail Studio, and this week I'm installing all the ducting for my hidden dust collector, adding some super cool, super smart automatic blast gates and some other really cool, really smart features. Stay tuned. When I decided I was gonna do all this ducting myself, I decided I was gonna make a how-to video. I was gonna become an expert on ducting, and that way I could show everybody how to do a really good professional dust collection install at home. The more I got into it, the more I realized I didn't know. So I learned some fundamentals and I will share those fundamentals with you, but there are some better people out there. There's a guy on YouTube, doesn't have a ton of subscribers, but his, his name is the, uh, the Sheet Metal Kid. So I highly recommend checking him out. He gave me a lot of pointers. I just kept watching video after video of the Sheet Metal Kid. What I will tell you, the main thing that I learned, this is both from Oneida, the Sheet Metal Kid, and everywhere else is you want the most gradual possible turns. You'll see that there are no 90 degree turns in my system. Everything is really just like a big sweeping. It's a 45 plus a 45. And I know that equals a 90, but you don't want a sharp T joint. Everything's gonna come out at an angle and then round over like you see right there. So it was kind of challenging learning how to make all this work in a pretty small space with keeping it all really gradual turns. Another really important tip that I learned that should be fairly obvious once you think about it is pay attention to which way everything goes together. So you'll see a lot of these crimped ends and when they go together, you wanna to keep the airflow going with that crimp so it doesn't get bound up and stick in those types of areas. So you will see quite a few places in my system when I'm installing this where I didn't do that. And that's because some of those spiral fittings were a little bit different size than the standard ducting. So you'll see it didn't always work out that way, but whenever possible, I try to keep the flow going with those crimps. Also, I try to use pretty much exclusively this spiral pipe and it is really, really heavy duty. You can't dent this. It is much, much sturdier than those click together pieces that you can get at Home Depot. So. More expensive, I was able to get all this from a local supplier, so I recommend going with this spiral stuff. It's just heavier duty, I'm gonna be able to take it down and move it with me or adjust it as needed. It was just so much sturdier and I can't help but think that the spiral actually helps airflow, but I don't have any idea if it actually does. So, all spiral pipe and spiral fittings where I could, however, I do have quite a few of these types of fittings too, which are not spiral. So, kind of a hodgepodge, but everything worked out in the end. A tip that I learned from the sheet metal kid that wasn't that intuitive is for crimping this sheet metal, you get these little crimping pliers and they have two prongs on one side and three on the other and you want the three prongs on the inside and that will make it an actual proper crimp all the way around. And you can try and see what happens if you do it the wrong way, it just won't fit very well. So three prongs on the inside, two prongs on the outside. I had my system kind of loosely drawn up from Oneida themselves, so that way I knew I got the proper transition on the proper runs, going from a seven inch down to a six inch. But what I found is most HVAC places don't stock seven inch hardly anything, so that made this a real challenge. Some parts I actually had to get on eBay, but this local sheet metal shop was a really good starting place for me to get most all of my fittings and ducting. If you're interested in the actual system that I'm using, I recommend checking out the video I did a couple weeks ago on installing this five horsepower Oneida Dust Gorilla with Smart Boost. A lot more information in that. I will include a link to that in the video description below. It all started by cutting into my drywall, and yes, I am going to basically put a big hole in the side of my house because I'm cutting through the drywall. Then I'll have to cut through the exterior sheathing right into that shed. And the good thing is it's not exposed to weather, so that is a plus. But yeah, I'm gonna have to go right through this nice siding and paint, trying not to hit that conduit there. This all goes super fast and smooth in this video, but it did not go this fast and smooth in real life. I had two big load-bearing beams to the left and right, so I could only go in this one little spot Spot. So I had to really angle this dust collector towards the only opening and in the end it worked out and it looked like it was super easy But it took a lot of wiggling and adjusting to get this to fit just right. I Wanted this to not only look good in the end But also provide pretty good insulation and not just be a hole in the side of my house So I took these pieces of plywood and made a couple cuts or I guess more than a couple cuts to get this to fit just right But in the end I got a pretty good fit. It wasn't the most pretty but I ended up adding some weather stripping around it so I have a good tight fit in the end. Then I could just fluff this insulation back up and have a pretty good seal. 
I feel like I just stared at my walls for like two days taking measurements and coming up with different ideas on how to best run this so I could hit every tool making as gradual of turns as possible. And in the end, it actually was a pretty good plan and everything did kind of just click together. So this was going to my table saw and I have that big beam there, which was nice so I could run it down on the back side and not really inhibit anything on that outfeed table. At every possible bend and joint, I attached it with sheet metal screws and real duct tape. And this doesn't mean the old gray stuff you have in your toolbox. This was really heavy duty stuff that was really expensive. So I'll include a link because I did go through a couple of different brands before I found the ultimate duct tape and it did make a big difference and was really strong. So everything with sheet metal screws and good proper duct tape. After I got that run to the table saw started, I was able to go back to the dust collector and start adding my Ys. And these Ys are actually spelled W-Y-E. If you need to search these, I found these on eBay and they are really good. But here's what I was talking about with the crimp being on the wrong side. I was really afraid that that dust would get caught in that seam right there. So I don't know that I should do this and if any of you are experts, but I added that duct tape in there to help smooth out that airflow. And it seemed like a good idea. If you know better, feel free to comment and let me know that that was a bad idea, but it seems like a good idea in my head. You can start to see some of the challenges I had here because I had to get all of those outlets and that 45 degree turn below that beam so I could make that run to my planer. Also, this coupler here is not meant for spiral fittings and it was the exact same size as my spiral pipe, so I couldn't really join them up. And I came up with a pretty unelegant solution and that was to cut that fat lip off of this reducer with these tin snips and God, if you're an HVAC person, you're probably mortified right now watching me hack this up. Also did learn that there's a difference between red and green tin snips. So one is meant to cut on one side and the other is meant to cut on the other side. I won't even try to say which one, but this is what I ended up doing and it worked in the end and I kept my crimp on the inside. So not the most elegant solution, but you do what you gotta do sometimes. This spiral ducting comes in 10 foot lengths and I don't think this has ever happened in the history of running duct, but this was exactly 120 inches from that fitting to that fitting. I didn't have to cut one inch off. I didn't have to add one inch. It was a miracle. So after this, I was riding high. Everything was just clicking together and going super easy after that. I used all self-tapping sheet metal screws, so don't use ones that require you to drill a pilot hole. That would take way too much time. Also, either my snips or my hands were too weak, so I used the jigsaw to cut a lot of these duct sections. Again, attaching it with the sheet metal screws and more good duct tape. This is a reducer because I was going from seven inches down to six inches. This was all from Oneida. They kind of gave me the rough idea of where I needed to make these transitions, so that way I wasn't just guessing. But from here, it was pretty easy. I just had to make a quick run over to my bandsaw and my drill press, and that was gonna be the end of this run. One of the biggest problems with my old system was the horrible fitting I had on my Grizzly planer. It was really bad airflow and it was way too small. So here's what I came up with. I used that old plumbing fitting, this RVT sealant, which is for gaskets like in car engines. It's gonna be plenty strong enough and definitely airtight. Then got that fitted on there and then just attached it with a hose clamp. So it was super sturdy and awesome airflow. From here was just a lot of loose ends. Here is the connection going to my router table and my table saw, the downspout to my planer. Again, the really cool thing is I can keep a six inch duct all the way to my planer, which is gonna be the optimal airflow. I had some people in my dust collector video very emphatically tell me that I must ground my ducting and it already was grounded. Here's a video of me grounding it. Just wanna emphasize that that could be a really big safety concern. I talked to my brother-in-law and he told me the best way was to run a ground into my actual electrical ground and that is gonna be the safest possible ground. I have to admit all of that ducting was pretty boring. So if you're still with me, now's where it gets pretty exciting, at least for a guy like me. This is the IVAC blast gate. There's no more manually opening and closing these blast gates. They are gonna turn on automatically when you turn your tool on. And I'll give you a quick rundown of how to install them. Obviously, first thing, turn off your power and I am back at the dust collector here. Every dust collector is gonna be a little bit different, so I won't tell you which wire goes where because you might have a Grizzly or a Laguna dust collector and it's gonna be different than mine, but IVAC sent me step-by-step -step instructions and it was really just plug and play. It was just connecting the green wire to the proper terminal, connecting the white wire to the proper terminal, connecting the black wire to the proper terminal, and then just put the cover back on. So it was really, really simple. It just took maybe 10, 15 minutes. I have to admit when I opened this up, it seemed pretty intimidating. It wasn't automatically intuitive until I got through the instructions a little bit, then it made a lot of sense. First thing you need to know is you need a tool sensor for every blast gate. 
right here. I am labeling it A3. I'm just telling it basically this is tool three and that way it sends the signal to the other tool, the other one I have labeled A3. The way I make the tool realize this is I get into their book and it just has a simple little code. It looks confusing as four, as five, as six. It's really not because all you do is pull that little door open and you put in the corresponding code for tool three. And I think this one I moved up switches four and five and that just tells this tool, hey, this is the code for tool three. And then once you get those switches up, you are just gonna do the same thing on the blast gate. It is really not that complicated. And you can actually use one tool sensor if you have dual blast gates, like my bandsaw has two ports. So I have two blast gates on one tool sensor. So really pretty easy. Make sure it's in the auto position there. That was one mistake I had was leaving it off. So if it's in auto, it will work every time, I promise. Besides your actual dust collector switch that I showed earlier, you don't have to get inside any tool. You just wrap this tool sensor around the cord and it will send the signal to the dust collector to turn on and to open the port. And you see just how fast it opens there. I actually got a little scared that it was gonna fall into my joiner. Moving on to the table saw, it went on this easy. I ended up coding the table saw tool one and I will talk a little bit more about that in a couple minutes. If you want fireproof, even heavier duty blast gates, they do make steel ones. I only got one steel one for my planer because I needed a six inch blast gate for that one. Again, I'm just attaching it to the cord and then plugging it in. That switch does require 110 power. So that is important to note, they don't power themselves. Attaching this with more of that heavy duty duct and then it works this easy. How cool is that? I did a couple more test runs with this and I found they work every single time. There was not a single time that the system failed. The only problems I had is when I had one of the switches in auto or I had the tool coded wrong. So make sure you have all the switches set up right, make sure you have the right code in there and it will work flawlessly. I have one more smart dust collection upgrade I will show you before I actually show you the system work. And this is one that I definitely needed since the dust collector was out in my shed and I couldn't really monitor the level. I needed a remote bin sensor. And so I got this one directly from Oneida. They tell you to put this uh, cardboard cutout in there to make sure that it doesn't mess with the sensor. It has a plug so you don't need to drill anything, you just fit it into the grommet. And then it has a slight little sensitivity adjustment here and when it's flashing it is basically saying there's dust right below it and so I kept adjusting it until I got it where I wanted and just plugged it into 110 power and that was it. So there I was testing the sensitivity of it to see how close I wanted to allow that to get to the top of the bin. Here I am testing the bandsaw. Turn on the blast gates, open immediately. It takes a couple seconds for the dust collector to fire up because it is so big, but no dust, no chips, no anything. After I turned it off, I go to open the door and it's so much suction, I actually couldn't open it for a second. And you can see all that pressure that released there. And then it turns off automatically after I think it's another 30 seconds that it will continue to run. This system is totally hackable, meaning you can adjust every aspect of it and it is really cool. I'll probably continue to play with it in the coming months. A couple of the features that I really liked is the first one, I have it set to run on a four minute minimum runtime. Because these large dust collectors aren't supposed to run off and on frequently like a small dust collector can, so I have a four minute minimum runtime. I have my table saw blast gate is always open unless another tool turns on and its gates opens, then the table saw blast gate will close. And this prevents you from running your system with all the gates closed and crushing it like a pop can. So a really cool safety feature. Also, I have a 30 second delay after my system turns off because the Oneida Smart Boost needs to completely wind down before restarting. So this prevents this system from messing with that and hurting your dust collector. So tons of features, really, really cool stuff. Uh, Thanks to the guys at IVAC for these units. They did provide them at no charge. So really cool system, and I'm gonna to continue to tinker with mine until I get it just right. All right, here are a couple more shots of the completed system so you can see how it all works together. If I wasn't clear on anything, if you have any questions, or maybe you're a duct guy and I did something completely wrong, let me know in the comments. I am super good about responding to every single question or comment in there. Also, some of you guys know, I like to give a little bit of credit to the people that make it all the way to the end of the video. So this week, start your question or comment with my name, Cam, C-A-M, not Kim or Carl or whatever some of you guys write, Cam. And that way I will know you watch the entire video and I promise I will answer all of your questions first. Again, thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe for more videos just like this one. Have a great week.